So hello everyone, lovely to have you here. Um, I suspect more people will roll in. Thanks so much everyone for the, for the chat ongoing so far. It's lovely to see. Uh, so look, we've all got, uh, you know, our nights ahead of us. So let, let's, uh, let's get on with tonight's presentation. Uh, I'm just gonna share my PowerPoint and um, if there's any problems. Now, the other person you shall see is Dr. Jill Gamberg, who is joining us as well. So now, Jill, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slide correctly there? Is it going back and forth? Yes, great, all right. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. It's absolutely lovely to be here. So my name is uh, Dr. Sam Manger, obviously, and uh, tonight we're talking about it's really what is lifestyle medicine and then some of the courses, the subjects that you, I assume, are signing up to inquire to about tonight. We've got about 250, 300 people sign up for the interest tonight, which is wonderful. I expect like most webinars these days, we were only getting about 10% of people turn up. So it's great to see that we've already got over 70 here, which is great. I'll just quickly start. I think it's appropriate to do so with just a quick acknowledgement of country. I'm on uh, Gubby Gubby land here on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. So Wanyan Nulam in Gubby Gubby language. And uh, I obviously acknowledge traditional custodians of the country in which I am, am taking place and obviously where uh, you are as well and all the indigenous elders past, present and emerging. And if you're from um, over the seas, then of course, uh, equally to our indigenous uh, brothers, sisters, colleagues over the seas. So uh, I'll just quickly say who I am. If you don't know who I am, I'm Sam Manger. I'm GP. I'm senior lecturer with James Cook University School of Medicine and GP training and coordinator for the lifestyle medicine subjects. I'm president of the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I have a podcast some of you might be aware of. And uh, last year I was uh, the Queensland GP of the year, which is lovely to be named such. And I will also hand it over to Dr. Jill Gamberg, who's joining us as well tonight. Uh, thanks, Sam. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm also a GP and um, I have a board certification in lifestyle medicine and I, I, I practice lifestyle medicine. Uh, and I'm also almost finished doing a master's degree in coaching psychology, which has really added to my practice as a, as a physician and GP. Um, I'm really happy to be here and excited to um, get some questions from you all. So please feel free to pop those in the chat box um, as we go, and uh, we'll, we're trying. We're going to try and get to all of them as possible. Thanks, Jill. Um, okay, so let's. I'll just quickly give a bit of rundown because obviously it's a webinar, so sadly we can't get everyone's faces on the screens and audios on. Um, that might be a little bit hectic with with almost ninety people now, but. So first, I'm just going to do a what is lifestyle medicine overview. If you've watched my YouTube talk, then it's a little bit of a repeat on some of that for sort of five to 10 minutes. But then I'm going to be going into the actual subjects, the structure, the price, RPL, some of those common questions that I have been getting. Uh, but I would re really like us to interact as much as possible. So if you have questions as we go, I will stop and answer them. So Jill's going to be monitoring. It would be great if you could use the Q&A function. Uh, so if you go on to your, uh, like on the Zoom screen, you'll see at the bottom, you'll have chat and then you should have a Q&A. So if you, if you type in your questions into that, uh, then we can, that's just an easier way to sort them out. Mm -hmm. I see a few people have gone onto the chat, but it looks like, yeah, great. Thanks, Jill. Um, so yeah, so let's just, let's get the ball rolling. So what is lifestyle medicine? So lifestyle medicine is exactly what it sounds like. It's lifestyle components as medicine, right? So the, the medicine of food, movement, physical activity, exercise is, is, you know, a slightly dirty word, but definitely movement of physical activity, mind body practices, whether that's meditation, stress management, breathing techniques, relaxation response, et cetera, and really understanding the impact of the mind on the rest of the our system, uh, sleep, addiction medicine, including smoking, alcohol, cessation, et cetera, connection with each other, which obviously so many of us now with COVID is highlighting how crucially important that is to our physical and mental health and social structure, full stop. And then connection with the natural world, which is an interesting area of a sort of blooming evidence. And then we combine that with behavioral science to so things like health coaching, psychology, uh, behavioral insights, nudging and other aspects so that we can actually inform and lead clinical practice as we practice now, but then the development of new models of care, because there are, in reality, we can all only be so good in the current model. Uh, there is natural limitations that are occurring and there are a lot of um, challenges being presented to us and ways we need to come up with new answers. Just as medicine and healthcare has always done, 
has evolved to meet the challenges of the time, we're now, I would argue, overdue for that to happen again. Um, and technology, obviously, it informs technology. Research is such a strong and important part, uh, whether that's uh, efficacy research or effectiveness real world research or evaluating and planning models of care or e health economic research, which is incredibly important in, in lifestyle medicine because it is so economically beneficial. And then, of course, steaming up to public policy. So quickly with the field of lifestyle medicine, uh, you know, what is it? Well, it is a relatively new field. It's only been around for about 15 years, give or take as a term in and of itself. Um, but it's obviously based on the strong, on the oldest roots when we look at, you know, any disease. You know, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine, to, you know, 2,000 years ago, give or take. So these are ancient principles, but put into the modern light of scientific uh, process and evaluation. We've got pretty good evidence in cardiometabolic disease, uh, cardiovascular and diabetes, for example, aging, uh, dementia, mental health. But really, it's, it is, I say, and have said this publicly on my podcast a number of times, that I feel that the field is actually, you know, it's already a very strong, impressive field, but we're really only at the beginning of it. And I'm, that excites me more than anything, because the amount of research and work we have to do, I mean, the vision in 10 years of what healthcare could be to me is incredibly exciting. Um, so life, so it, it's, it's a term, lifestyle medicine, which covers obviously many subdomains. Lifestyle psychiatry is already a term that, that exists in the literature. Lifestyle cardiology, endocrinology are sort of popping up here and there, and I suspect to be formalized at some point. And we are certainly moving towards those First Nations philosophies in health, the idea of us being connected to each other, connected to, like I said, the natural world and to what we, what we eat and consume. Now, a few little reality checks, because these are some things that I can get asked about. And I think it's important just to say it sort of up front. It's kind of common sense, but, you know, we're running this course at JCU. There's no financial or ideological conflict of interest. Um, there's, we use multiple evidence-based dietary approaches, Mediterranean diet, plant only, low carb, etc. cetera. Uh, if it's evidence-based and it's targeted, then we will review it. Um, social determinants, absolutely critical um, when it comes to lifestyle medicine. It's absolutely considered, included, targeted. Uh, but, and I'll show you on the next slide, lifestyle medicine is often considered sort of halfway point between clinical medicine as it stands now, which is predominantly pharmacotherapy and procedural, and public health, which is sort of, you know, looking at the sort of obviously the larger public domains. But lifestyle medicine fits very nicely and brings those areas together. How can we bring that into the front line? And it's not alternative or complementary medicine. So this is the lifestyle medicine model of disease uh, created by Professor Gary Egger uh, and adapted by me some years ago. Um, just to demonstrate that obviously with lifestyle medicine, we're, we're thinking about those root causes. We're thinking about the proximal, medial and distal causes. We're thinking about the modifiable factors and the things that we deem unmodifiable. Maybe they're more modifiable than we appreciated once. It used to be thought that genetics are just hardwired, as we know, but now we've got epigenetics and a whole raft of areas that are demonstrating that we can have some influence on those areas. So there is more and more we're seeing that we can actually change, and it is about empowering us as a profession or as a community and empowering our patients to target these areas, which then impact all those markers I've got there, neuronal damage, neurotrophic factors, blood pressure, inflammation. And I wrote here just impact on COVID. It's potentially a controversial thing to say, but at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that things like life, uh, obesity, um, diabetes, smoking, et cetera, are some major risk factors for se the severe COVID. Um, and clearly, if we fortify our state as best as possible, that's a good thing. Um, Jill, you keep an eye on the q and I'll just stop and start if, if, any, if any come up. So here's, this is from our colleagues in the British okay, Society. Sam, maybe a good question to just pop in here. Um, a few Please. people are asking, do you have to be a doctor? to complete this qualification. So maybe just up front. Yeah, please. So uh, no, no is the short. Most, most this, okay. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so absolutely not, no, you don't. In fact, dare I say, I prefer you weren't a doctor. <laughs> I think that the, <laughs> I think the healthcare system is too doctor centric as it stands now in, in truth. Uh, and, I, and that's part of my, part of what we're teaching here is how do we decentralize healthcare? Um, and absolutely, that's an interdisciplinary approach or multidisciplinary approach. The reason I say interdisciplinary instead of multidisciplinary is because multidisciplinary still denotes a somewhat siloed approach to healthcare. But interdisciplinary is saying, no, actually, as we cross and work together across disciplines, how then can we deliver healthcare? You'll see, which I bring up a slide later, the number of people who've been involved in this 
creating this program at JCU. We've had obviously myself as a GP, other GPs, we've had exercise physiologists, physios, psychologists, public health experts, um, research experts, neurologists, all kinds of people, business people involved in on the input of this. So any health professional with a primary health with it with a, a health degree can apply for these courses. And for the graduate certificate, anyone with a primary degree in anything. So you could be an educator um, or, or anything. So, so um, it's absolutely open. So the grad cert, like I said, for really anyone with a primary degree, I will apply, I will review those applications though, just to make sure they are congruent and appropriate. Um, but for the graduate diploma and masters, any health professional, and I and I really do encourage you to, you know, to think about it. Um, obviously, any other questions there, Jill? I see a few popping up. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, they're probably a bit more specific to the questions you're going to answer at the end of your talk, so we might leave it for there. Okay, great. All right. I'll just move on. So I just want to comment on this point um, about is it alternative medicine? Lifestyle medicine is it is the first recommendation in almost every guideline you read, lifestyle measures. But what we're really doing here is formalizing, okay, rather than just tokenistically saying eat healthy, um, we say, okay, how do we really turn that into a proper discipline? You know, what, what specifically is it? How do we help people change their behaviors? How do we adapt our models of care? How do we build in things like peer support workers, technology, and all these other areas to support people in their change? And then how do we address and be proactive? So this is far more than just a sort of tokenistic little recommendation. This is just some copy and pasting from the um, National Heart Foundation guidelines, atrial fibrillation. I gave a talk to um, the PHN not long ago and you can see that the evidence for things like monitoring sleep, exercise, and weight in AF is, is as evidence-based as what we all get taught in medical school about this CHADS FAST score. And it reduces uh, the chance of getting AF, the chance of switching in and out of AF, and the severity of AF. So this is, some, this is, this is medicine. Uh, and in regards to the field, there are three new journals in the last five years, give or take, that have been created. Um, I'm on the editorial board for the, U, uh, the Wiley, the one at the top here, the UK one, um, and there are two ones, international ones, American as well. So there's, there's a, as I say, a growing field here. So why do we need it? Well, I think it's, it's evident enough, but I will explain it anyway. hundred years ago, obviously the major causes of death were things like infections, childbirth, trauma, um, et cetera. Uh, but now it's chronic disease. So we've done incredibly well, as I say, with modern medicine, with sanitation, public health, antibiotics, surgery, ICU, vaccinations. All these approaches have saved countless numbers of lives. You can see the maternal mortality, childcare mortality gone down. Back in the 30s and 40s, one in four children died before the age of four. Never happens now. So well done. But the times are changing and with them, we must change as well. Chronic disease is absolutely the leading cause of disease and death um, in the world. So not just in countries like economically developed countries like Australia, um, but all around the world now. 50% of Australians have one chronic disease, 25% have more. A third of people over 70 are taking five or more meds. 20% of people have prediabetes or diabetes. And one, this is before COVID, one in eight Australians were using antidepressants. And that doubled in the sense that the number of antidepressant prescriptions had doubled um, in the 10 years before COVID. It's gone up another between 30 to 40% over the last two years. So there's, there's clearly something, something that we're missing in the way that we're presenting health at the moment. This costs money. The health, Australian government health expenditure is just creeping up and up. It's growing faster than population growth. Um, and it's expected to double over the next sort of 40 years, uh, which, is, which is quite worrying. And, and many reports have come out and said it's clearly unsustainable in the direction we are going. And a guiding question which I pose throughout the subjects is about health. That's obviously a typo, not healthy equity, health equity. Um, you know, how do we deliver lifestyle and social medicine to those that need it most? We know that people with lower socioeconomic states suffer and die from, from modifiable and avoidable causes more so. So that's a real challenge, you know, in, in the sense of what are the what are the barriers to care and how do we deliver care in a better way? So there was a, an interesting review in 2019 
uh, done by the Mitchell Institute and Victoria University on looking at Australian healthcare. And this, I, I took this from there. Business as usual is not an option. We need new ways of financing, delivering high quality contemporary care to more people with chronic and complex conditions and diseases. So this, what I'm proposing with lifestyle medicine, what the whole movement of lifestyle medicine, not just me, it's an international, you know, many, many thousands of practitioners are proposing that we, we cannot continue in the trajectory we are. So I, shall I pause and see if there's any questions, Jill? Sure, they're, they're mostly related to um, questions about the course, but we can, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's- I'm there's happy to answer some. About, Sure. Okay. So is the COVID-19 injection needed for the master's course? No. Well, not that I'm aware of because it's all online. So, mm -hmm. exactly. yeah. And um, then there was a couple of other ones here. Is, as a GP, is it better to join JCU or ASLAM? What is the difference? Um, well, I mean, it's not really a conversation about ASM tonight. I mean, it, it's up to you whether you yeah. think that these, these subjects are, you know, attractive to you and you want to do the grad cert or grad dip or masters. I will say that all of that can be, all of these courses in one way or another can be used as, um, as RPL, so to speak, towards a fellowship with ASLAM. So if you do a masters at JCU, you are eligible for a full fellowship. So you get two qualifications. Um, if you do a grad dip or a grad cert, you can still use those points to collate, you know, to a fellowship. If Am, am I going to say one is better than the other? Look, I would probably say that this is better, <laughs> but that's obviously I'm highly biased. But, but you know, this has had, I know what, I know in detail what this has in it. Um, and it's, it's well-rounded. It's got great depth and great breadth. Um, and to me, really, this is just the beginning, what, what we've done here. I mean, I'm really excited about, the growth um, both within JCU for this whole field. So I hope that answers your question. There's no reason you can't do both, join both. And in fact, I would encourage you to be part of a wider lifestyle medicine community, um, you know, but, but they're not, uh, they're congruent and, you know, do what, do what you must. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. Um, the other one, they're just asking a few different things about pathways and whatnot, but one easy question is asking if this is a bachelor's degree and um, it's a master's degree or grad cert, grad diploma. Okay. And then I think we might leave the rest to the end, Sam. Sure. Yeah. So no, it's not an undergraduate degree. It's postgraduate training. So it's grad cert, mm -hmm. grad dip, master's. Okay. So AQF eight and nine. So an undergraduate degree is an AQ of seven. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly just give a little bit more of a synopsis of the evidence. Some of you will know this because you may have watched my YouTube talk. So feel free just to contemplate and reflect for a little bit. So when it comes to prevention, it's, it's, it's not uh, controversial at all to say that the, the majority of chronic disease can be prevented. Over 90% of diabetes, over 80% of heart disease, over a third of cancers, and that number is creeping up. It used to be 10% of dementia, now it's 20 and 30. It's now 40% in one of the more recent Lancet um, commissions on this. So as time goes on, as research goes on, we're realizing more and more how effective these things are with very simple lifestyle interventions. But then what we really want to get excited about is actually intervening and reversing disease. So this is the Lifestyle Heart, uh, heart Trial five-year RCT, which looked at a, a lifestyle approach, not just a dietary approach exercise, diet, this is a whole food plant-based diet, stress management training, smoke cessation, saw a reversal in atherosclerosis. So on the right of this picture, you can see coronary arteries in an angiogram for those who, who may not be medical here. And on the left, you can see the sort of blocking and the narrowing of that artery that occurs. And this person is either having angina or soon to have a heart attack. On the right here, you can see how that artery is opened up. And what they then they've repeated this study uh, in the sense of studies like this a few times now. And you can see the difference in stenosis is quite pronounced after five years, 35%. And for those who are medical here will know that the difference between saying having 35% stenosis that's stable, you don't really do much, you might just medically manage it, um, versus 70% stenosis, we're talking a very different management. So impressive. And then if we look, why do we look at say, um, uh, diabetes, we know that there's multiple approaches to putting diabetes in remission, whether it's low calorie versions, low carb versions, uh, versions uh, whole food plant-based versions. And the evidence says up to 80% of people can be put in remission with type 2 diabetes if they've had diabetes for less than six years. 
We know that with approaches like, uh, as I said, dementia, there's more and more evidence coming out from randomized control trials now that you can improve um, cognitive functioning in various ways. Processing speed in particular, I give a whole talk on this and I won't go through it now, but it's a fascinating talk because it gets in, well, it's a fascinating topic, sorry, because it gets into the, the real mechanisms of the sort of neurophysiology here. And some papers in the last couple of years, this <clears throat> paper at the bottom here is from Nature Communications, a very high quality journal, looking at approaches like fasting mimicking diet, which is a five day low calorie diet, uh, low calorie fasting approach that's as effective as dexamethasone. So when people have chemotherapy, radiotherapy for their cancers, often that will cause a lot of cell death and inflammation and they give people steroids like dexamethasone to reduce that inflammation. Um, because to, to stop the sort of side effects of the, of the medication. And the fasting mimicking diet was as effective as dexamethasone in reducing the side effects of chemo, but also improve the outcomes of their treatment. So they have more complete response from the treatment. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on here. And I'm really just giving you the absolute, not even the tip of the iceberg, it's more like a snowflake on the iceberg, but it's because um, this is obviously something we talk for months and weeks about. Um, but when we talk about the mechanisms here, again, I just put this slide on here really to highlight that it's not one receptor, one cell, one pathway that we're activating here. And I could talk about each of these pathways here for hours, but you know, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, obviously one of our major hormonal uh, stress response axes. We know about the effects on the brain, increased brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is a very important sort of growth and stimulating uh, factor in our brain, um, reduces inflammation, reduces oxidative stress, improves the gut microbiome. Kynurinine pathway is fascinating. We, I'll save that for the subjects and, and epigenetic change. So, so there's lots of profound effects happening here. And the reality is that's just diet. All of these lifestyle components work via different mechanisms. I'll quickly just say, you know, with depression, for example, exercise has been shown to be as effective as antidepressants and psychotherapy in depression, improve quality of life, and even be effective in cognitive symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, in schizophrenia. In sleep, it's a busy slide, but more just to demonstrate the, the we, we spend a whole, uh, quite a bit of time on sleep in the, in the intro to life, introduction to lifestyle medicine subject, but point being here is that sleep obviously has an amazing and important impact on brain health um, and on the immune function of your body and hormonal effects. Social connection, there was a 2010 meta-analysis of 300,000 people showing a 50% increased likelihood of survival with people with stronger social relationships. And this was as strong as smoking 15 to 20 cigarettes a day, the, the strength of that relationship. Mind practices was, was one of my areas of passion um, and uh, I suppose growing expertise. Um, again, you know, high level evidence now shows how impressive it can be in some of our most prevalent chronic conditions, whether it's depression or pain um, and anxiety. Um, and again, I won't delve too much into this. I'm really just giving you an overview just so you can have some confidence that what we're talking about here is actually having a biological physiological mechanism and is actually making a difference. It's not just theoretical. Uh, this is about stress and you know, stress, whether it's physiological stress, like physical stress, whether you know, uh, poor diet, poor sleep, sleep deprivation, sedentary behavior and or psychological stress and or social isolation, uh, which can which triggers the same neural threat response um, has major impacts on the brain, uh, whether it's due to what's called the microglia, which are immune cells, about 15% of the brain are microglia, which are your derivative macrophages or immune cells of the brain. And their jobs are to clean, essentially, fight infections, but clean the synapses, remove debris from the day, change inflammation. Um, when you're stressed, those microglia change phenotype and they become pro-inflammatory. So your brain becomes inflamed. You get neuroinflammation. You also get reduction of the amount of uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and all those nice things. And so what do you get? Well, of course, then you get effects, don't you? You get fatigue, you get stress intolerance, you get mood changes, you get effects on your cognition and learning. Um, so again, there's very profound, deep effects that occur here. And when we think about what we're dealing with on the front line, a lot of the time, well, we're dealing with these symptoms, but we're treating them with medication. And that's not necessarily wrong. 
but it's just a case of, okay, but we need to get down to those root causal factors. And if we can't do that because of the system, say, i.e. because of the way we practice 15 minute appointments, okay, well then we need to address that. We can't simply accept defeat and say, well, that's it, nothing I can do. Now, I will just quickly highlight that this is not just about our patients. This is about us, the professions, the therapists as well, because you know, a lot of, a lot of us are burning in, out at the moment. Um, and that's not just because of COVID, it's obviously a major factor, but it's uh, demonstrating the, 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 the way the system works and the pressures on us. But this was happening and leading and create and building up before COVID. So it's evident to me that, and you know, Jill, I'm sure can, can agree, attest to this, but this is not making a lot of health professionals happy the way we're practicing now. So we, we're looking for change. We're seeking change for ourselves and for our patients. So really the question is, I mean, this didn't actually show interestingly, but this guy's got a drill press and he's putting through a tiny piece of wood with it. And really the question is, do we need new tools for the job? And, and I would argue, yeah, absolutely, yes, we do. And we need a lot more health professionals and professionals being part of this solution. Um, are there any questions, Jill, that we need to stop? Or are they still about the course? Because we're getting there. We're almost to the course bit, guys. <laughs> They're all, they're all about the courses. Maybe one here that would be nice to answer. Mm -hmm. um, RN here, my long held passion has been a nurse led clinic focusing on preventive health for single mums. I've looked in many directions and was so excited to find this one. Do you see potential to explore specific applications and projects such as this in the course? Awesome. I love it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> I will, I will get onto this actually, because that this comes back down to the sort of the flow of the subjects and how it can support you and all that sort of stuff. So I will come back to this. So clearly people don't need to hear this, but I'm going to finish these slides anyway. Um, but it's good that I guess not many people have questions about live streamers. And I guess you're just like, yeah, yeah, we get that. We know it works. We just want questions about the course. So I'll quickly draw through these next yeah. few slides. Um, partly because I was talking about the system and, and the models of care which we deliver. And this actually partly comes back to the question of people coming up with new ways of, of doing care. And nurse-led care is, is absolutely spot on. Um, so we can either think of things like, I think of things in tiers. So I think, okay, how can I improve my one-to-one -one care? And that's through things like just knowledge of lifestyle medicine, my health coaching skills, et cetera. Then I think about new models within the practice and I think of peer support models. I think of shared medical appointments or group visits. I think of using health technology, et cetera. And then I think, okay, well then what about my community? So what about my, my community or the workplaces or the schools where people exist in the micro environments with which we exist? And then I think about the macro environments. And I put that actually, now I think about it, this is something I drew up for you. So this is my amazing graphic design skills. Um, now, and, you know, really it's a case of, you know, we have the self, we have our micro environments where we have some influence to change. Uh, as health professionals, we can advocate support people. And that could be, I do a, we do a whole section on behavioral insights and nudging. So it may be using those techniques that have been used, dare I say, against us um, for the last 50 years um, for us, for health. So how can we use all these techniques that marketing and behavioral insights have been using for a long time to make us drink Coke and eat Maccas? How can we use that for good, to improve our health? So how can we alter these micro environments to be conducive? It's really an important question because the individual behavior change is one target, but it's quite hard to change if you don't think about the environment, the context with which that person exists. And then there's obviously new ways of doing clinics. And I've mentioned shared medical appointments. Uh, uh, I've, I've run these, I've run classes, I've run community events, I've run film events. Uh, in my community um, and I find it to be one of the most rewarding aspects and at the moment they are to be honest on pause because of COVID and this peak but I cannot wait to get back into it when it is all uh, done and again just so you can be confident and Jill can comment on this far more than I can but you know the, things like health coaching which which are not free of controversy. There is um, in the sense that there's hard to define and that's why there's been a uh, push in the more recent years to define it more rigorously in the evidence base. But this evidence is just building and building and building um, for that. And I've mentioned here about using behavioral insights and nudging. This is just one of the acronyms that's commonly used. You don't need to worry about it. You can copy the screen if you so wish, but if you're gonna sign up for the cause, we're going through all of this in a lot of detail. I've mentioned group visits as well. 
you know, on the right here is perhaps your class, more classic shared medical appointment when we're talking about chronic disease, which obviously is more common in, in elderly, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. I've run them for a range of conditions. On the left here is run by uh, Pam Douglas, who's a GP in Brisbane and uh, runs, many will, will, may know, the Possums program about um, new parents and sleep and feeding and all the other realities of parenthood that hits you in the first year, and they run shared medical appointments for that. So it's a lifestyle medicine of childhood and parental time, which as we know, is absolutely so important to get to and target. And I'll just mention quickly that there are, it, it goes on and on. So obviously I could spend hours talking about this, but there's, there's different ways. And I go through these subjects, we go through case studies, your assessment supports, your opportunity to go and explore these um, and develop your own. This is perhaps one of my favorite examples because this is altogether better from UK. And this is from a quote from a GP there saying, I estimate that almost half of patients I see every week could be better supported by someone else. They don't need to see someone with five degrees. And you know, so the, I, what they've done here is they've sent an invitation to the community to volunteer their time to the clinic. Uh, so essentially peer support and a, developed a raft of programs as a result. And, and it's ideas like this that are popping up around the world that are not yet really strictly formalized or scaled in a large way um, but these are the things we've got to highlight study see what the core components of fidelity are that work and then bring it out and then adapt it to different circumstances and it's exciting again i mean clearly my excitement is evident um, and then there are any number of digital approaches whether and we go through this in quite some detail on the subjects, the different digital approaches, whether it's education platforms, text-based approaches, um, algorithm-based approaches. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a little summary of some of the technology you can use within health coaching, whether it's identifying people who are at risk, whether it's supporting them in a peer support matter, whether it's provide, supporting them after the appointment to either monitor or educate, et cetera. So there's so many options here that we're not using. And I'll just quickly mention health economics. I mentioned this at the beginning of being at such a cool and point. And, the, and really the, the, the take home point of this slide is simply that lifestyle interventions are extremely cost-effective compared to medication um, and in all age groups. So this is from the Primary Health Reform Steering Committee this last year, apologies. Um, and it said reform will require standing against underlying resistance structurally embedded in the health system through its fragmented, siloed and hierarchical nature, promoted largely through funding that incentivizes throughput and episodic treatment of sickness. That does kind of sum it up and it sounds critical, but that's not me saying that. That's, that's the reform steering group. So we are look this, this, what we're talking about here with lifestyle medicine, you can tell I'm relatively informal in the way that I'm talking to you, but that's because I would rather be authentic and real about the problems that we're presented with and us working as a team to create solutions than pretending anything else. Okay, so that, that's, uh, now I'm gonna talk about the courses, but are there any questions about anything I've said so far? Sam, I'm gonna read out two great questions that don't have to do with the course per se, more lifestyle medicine. Yeah. So I thought maybe we could answer those first. So this one is, um, does this paradigm shift also allow for whole family consults instead of one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, is the short version. Um, <laughs> so, you know, absolutely. And there, there's, this is where it gets exciting. So one has to think about how one achieves those things in the current, you know, funding mechanisms. There, there is no reason you can't actually, you, you can fund shared medical appointment group visits on Medicare as it stands, interestingly. Um, and you can also fund family visits, but there, you, there's certain ways you've got to do it um, to stick with the rules, obviously. And, and we've never had any problems with that. Um, there was a second question within that um, that I was going to think of, but um, family visits, no, it's lost. But that's okay. But yes, is, is the short version. Um, mm -hmm. The, oh, no, that's right. Yeah, multidisciplinary appointments. So this is one of my, I don't know, passionate points, I suppose, is, is within the Medicare funding arrangement is multi, a code for multidisciplinary codes, which doc GPs can bill for and specialists can bill for, but allied health can't bill for, which is the main reason that they don't happen. Um, and so 
like I see it, I mean, this is sort of slightly outside the scope of this tonight, but I definitely see um, a major <laughs> campaign that needs to be built around subsidizing allied health appropriately for that time um, so that we can actually deliver proper multidisciplinary care. So if you end up joining the course and we, you join the team as it were, um, you know, then we can, we can put that pressure on together. I agree wholeheartedly. Here's another great question. In your opinion, what is the most interesting things we are learning from our First Nations people in this space? <laughs> wow, so much, you know, we're doing, we're doing actually a raft of programs at the moment um, in uh, two, what, well, three different Aboriginal community controlled health organizations. Um, and the philosophical uptake is, you know, is, is very quick and easy because this is very in line. With, when, we, when we start talking about what I'm talking now, you, you know, the look is one of sort of like, yeah, like we've been talking about this for 60,000 years, you know, so it's like, you know, we've been talking and we don't call them group visits or shared medical appointments. We call them yarn ups in those environments. And obviously there's men yarn ups and women's yarn ups and elder yarn ups and young people's yarn ups. And there's different components there. So when I, when I think about what are we learning from the philosophy there, I think, you know, if I was to sound over simplistic, um, I would say that connection to self and really understanding what is going on internally, connection to the community, and COVID's made us realize that, but this is absolutely like biologically, neurophysiologically, um, being lonely, for example, is, you know, there, there's certain, certain scientists in their papers who say it's the equivalent, the flow down effects of stress and damage that it sends to the body is the same as getting punched in the face. So that's incredibly important. And then also connection to country. Uh, you know, there's, there's some fantastic evidence, which I didn't put in here and I was really tempted to, but I had to keep this cold um, about the impact of the natural world on our health. Now that's obvious in certain ways like vitamin D and sunshine, but it's also profound in other ways. So for example, um, people who are admitted to hospital who can see nature or see the sunshine have about 20 to 30% lower requests for analgesia, lower complaints um, and in complications in general. So, and even it speeds up wound healing, which they've actually gone and studied. They've taken biopsies of people's wounds and looked at the matrix of the wounds, the actual co connective tissue within the wounds and check them over days for people who are watching, just can see nature versus those who are within a contained space. And they can actually see that at the wound level, at the way that the collagen fibers are aligning and the strength of them is far better in those who are in that setting. So we're talking about very, very physical benefits, which obviously then flow into psychological. And so that was a really long winded answer, but hopefully it did partially answer it. Um, Sam, most of the rest of the questions are specific to the course. So I might just let you speak to that. Cool, thanks. So thanks. I just wanted to, because one of the common questions I get in this is career opportunities. Um, people will naturally be thinking, okay, that's great, but what can I do with it? Um, and so I thought I was going to throw to Jill to because she's obviously a practitioner, and then I'm going to throw in my two cents afterwards. Mm. I mean, I think there's so many ways we can use lifestyle medicine. First of all, it's not just for prevention or treatment. Um, we can use it in all avenues of medicine um, or, or, or healthcare. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a nurse or a nutritionist or a doctor or um, any other allied health professional. You can do many things with this degree or with lifestyle medicine. So it's, it's, for me, it's an essential part of what medicine is. We've got medications, we've got uh, procedures, and then we've got lifestyle medicine or behavior modification. So you can get into research and teaching and um, community care it can be in the private and the public sector. Uh, hopefully these are all you know, on the up and up. Uh, I personally am working in the private sector at the moment in a new lifestyle medicine clinic and I'm hoping that's going to open so many more doors to be able to branch out lifestyle medicine, even into the public, looking at taking care of people who've had cancer, you know, helping them to get healthy again, even getting well while they're 
going through chemotherapy. So they're just, I could go on for 10 minutes about how you can use lifestyle medicine, but there are so many, many options, aren't there, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks, Jill. I'm just going to go back to my slide. I think I, no, no, I'm good. Um, so I'm just going to share some of my experience about career opportunities here. So um, obviously we're talking about multiple domains. So we're talking about well-being, but we're also talking about public health. We're talking about lifestyle medicine. Social medicine is not a term you hear very often these days. It was a, it was a field that sort of died off, I think partly because social medicine sounds like communism. So it probably didn't get the sales, but um, obviously, when we talk about social medicine, we're talking about targeting social determinants, mental health, chronic disease, service program development, health coaching. So there, there's some broad categories that, that you can have some impact on. Now, obviously, if you're a clinician, it's going to improve your clinical practice. And that's just that's just what happens. And it's, it's, it makes the job, to me, rewarding, refreshing. I love seeing that look in my patient's eyes. I had one the other day when I asked him about, he came in with any number of problems, as is often the case these days. And I asked him, you know, who does he have in his life that he trusts and confides in? And it was, what? <laughs> it was this uh, out of left field question. And then I said, well, and I gave him some techniques, which I will provide in the, in the actual courses about how to connect with, you know, past relationships, friends, et cetera. And he gave me this look out of this eye, like, wow, this guy actually really cares. And, and that's a feeling I get a lot. And it's a lovely feeling. So you get better outcomes and you feel yourself more rewarded. But if you're going to be everything in lifestyle medicine outside clinical practice, in my well, even actually, I'll take that back. Even clinical practice is a team-based approach. You cannot be the, the you know the lord of everything. I mean, I'm certainly not. And the mm -hmm. it, you end up being you're part of the team, but you work within a team, and that's the beautiful thing about lifestyle medicine. And so we talk about how can you be a valuable member of that team? What can you bring to the table? You can bring your lifestyle medicine knowledge. You can bring your behavior change, behavioral science knowledge and the model of care subject. You can bring your model of care. How do you plan? How do you evaluate? How do you scale models of care? How do you use technology, peer support programs, shared medical appointments, et cetera, to bring into this model? Because these are the, these are the approaches on the horizon, so to speak. So, so you can be incredibly valuable as a part of a team for that reason. If you're in research, which I dabble in research, but not, not much. Um, you know, again, there's a lot of research happening now in the lifestyle medicine space. Um, and, and I could, and, and there's obviously teaching opportunities, JCU, there's another um, couple of universities at the moment too. Uh, and, and research to me is a very exciting area to be doing a lot of this. And a lot of the research is looking at models of care now, not just the efficacy trials. So how do we actually deliver care um, and, you know, watch this space? I'm doing a lot more consulting now and I'm doing so much consulting, in fact, that I am saying no to most of the jobs and I really would love to have more really high level lifestyle medicine experts who I know I can refer to. <laughs> so, you know, whether it's cancer programs and I'm working now consulting with the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, who's building a whole new oncology service about well-being, And we've been working on that for about six plus months. Um, on co-design, developing programs around lifestyle medicine and oncology. Um, different foundations are looking at mental health and all their specific areas. So there's no shortage of opportunities, including state, federal and council governments. I've consulted for them too. There's, you, you will be in demand, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. And if you want to move into media, which some people do, some people may follow people like Dr. Rangan Chatterjee or Dr. Rupi Alia or um, Dr. Priya Alexander, who did um, the Catalyst episode recently. Um, so all these people, you know, say they talk about lifestyle medicine and they've used that as their platform. So if that's your interest, to be honest, we need more health professionals to do reliable health communication. So and some of the assessment is actually based around that. Um, and, you know, that is something I strongly encourage. So you can see here that we've got lots of options. The reason the grad cert I've left open to non-health professionals on application, I have to review them, of course, is because I, as I said, I want to decentralize healthcare. I don't see why this should be owned by doctors and, in, and it shouldn't be. And for example, why can't a teacher learn these principles and bring it into their classroom? Why can't a corporate boss bring it into their workplace? There's no reason why they can't. Um, so, so I've done that, but then it does get to a point with the diploma that we're getting quite advanced in the knowledge and then for medical legal reasons 
I'm not comfortable with teaching them that level of knowledge. So, so this gives you a little brief of the three levels, grad, cert, grad, dip, master. There are Commonwealth supported places and obviously fully uh, full fee places. Uh, if you are an Australian citizen or permanent resident or a New Zealand citizen or permanent resident, you are eligible for the Commonwealth supported place. Um, so on Commonwealth supported places, it's about, this is assuming you have no recognition of prior learning. So obviously the price goes down if you have recognition of prior learning. Um, so it's $4,000 for the grad cert, eight for the grad dip and 12 for the masters. That's pretty, that's standard, if not, you know, mid range for most universities at the moment. Um, the grad cert can be done full-time or part-time. That's up to you. Uh, I think you'd be really, I, I just would, if you're going to do something, if you're going to do the grad cert full-time, I would recommend that you don't work <laughs> because it's four subjects. It's a lot of work. And the last thing I want you to do is burn out. But of course, if you want to do it, go for it. Um, the grad dip and the masters are at this stage only part-time for the reason I basically just said that I, most people who are applying this are working in some capacity. And I wouldn't recommend more than two subjects a semester for anyone working because one, it's just about, you know, you've actually got to learn the content, not just sort of skim through it. And the other reason is I don't want you burning out. There's no point studying a course on how to improve people's well-being in the healthcare system and then burning yourself out in the process. Trust me, I know from personal experience. So, um, so that's the reason. But, you know, I, I'm hoping that in the next year or two, we will make it full time for those who do just want to plow through it, take some time off. Um, but at this stage, that's that's not an option. Um, and I think I've talked about that. Now, if you have a master's in public health, if you are a dietitian who's done extra training, if you're an EP, if, you, if you've done some ASLAM training or, you know, whatever, you, you've got a fellowship and you've been an experienced GP for 10 years, been, you feel you've been doing some of this, write to admissions. It will get sent to me. I will review the your learnings and your application and I will reply to you and, and, and talk to you about where I can see you getting RPL, perhaps for some of the subjects, the core subjects, or the electives, which I would prefer you use them for the electives. I mentioned just right at the beginning, just to really demonstrate how multidisciplinary this has been. We've had all these professions and schools and colleges from JCU have input. They've reviewed the lectures. They've contributed to the writing. Um, I have really made a lot of effort to involve the different fields here. Now, these are the six core subjects of the masters. And I put here on the right, grad cert, grad dip and masters. Um, so there are four subjects in a graduate certificate. There are eight in a graduate diploma and there are 12 in a masters. Now, the three CP means three credit points. So, you know, basically, let me six to 12 credit points for a grad cert. What is it? 24 for a graduate diploma and 36 credit points for a masters. It's all a little bit, you know, administrative, but um, the point is, is that when you do recognition prior learning, you can have up to a maximum of 12 credit points or roughly four subjects in RPL. So that can significantly cut down the amount of time this is going to take you slash workload, which is good. Um, like I said, those graduate certificate first three subjects plus one elective um, is, is the graduate certificate level, which can be done by any health, any professional with a primary degree. The graduate diploma subjects are we're now moving into pretty pretty intensive health professional territory so that's why it's restricted so research methodology you know i i make it very clear throughout this the subjects i cite references we try and use the latest meta-analyses and system, systematic reviews when we're talking about data um and i try and be very open about what what it is and what isn't um and but in the lifestyle medicine assessment prescription we're you know, really getting into the detail about, you know, what are the, what are the specific approaches for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, duh, 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 duh. what are the different programs that one can involve? So, like I said, that's quite fine detailed and hence requires the practice of scope and training of a health professional to know when and when is not the right time to do that. And I, like I said, research is so, so central. And then the master's project I'll quickly speak to, what time have we got? 10 to eight. Um, so, your master's project is a capstone project. And it can really be, this comes back to your question before um, the nurse asked me who runs those clinics. Your master's project can be any, basically anything you want it to be. You could, you could set up a project in your clinic or in your community or in the school, or you, know, you, could, you could develop a lifestyle medicine education program um, for the profession or for the public. You could do a meta-analysis if you wanna focus on research and publish 
Um, the main component of the masters is if you're going to do a program, whatever that be, could be a technology thing, it could be a face to face thing, there's lots of options. You need to meet with me or one of the other supervisors within the university so we can tick off and say, yes, that seems appropriate. And you need to do an evaluation of it in some capacity. Okay, so um, whether that's a qualitative or quantitative, quantitative evaluation. Now, so there's a lot of flexibility there and primarily we, we talk about that fairly early on. So in the model of care subject, for example, one of the assessments is plan, plan a model of care, plan a service. So just theoretical, have fun, enjoy the process. What could, if you could do anything, what would you do? But that can form the basis if you're going on to the masters of your project, you can start right there. Then in the research methodology health professionals, you can do the ethics applications and you can use that to build, use the assessment there to build up your, your, um, your plan and, you get and then you get ethics approval through the university. So by the time you've got to the masters, you, you've, you're well, well and truly baked. And the, the master's project now is six credit points. So it's worth two subjects. So it gives you that time with supervision from me and a workplace supervisor. And I will, and I do, want to meet you, the students, at a semi-regular basis, one-to-one, -one, because I want to know how you're going. I want to be able to support you. Those who know me have known I've been involved in GP training for about seven years, and before that, med student teaching for, for five years. And, and so I'm, I'm very passionate about knowing you and what you want to get. So, so that's, that's the master's, I suppose, the Capstone Project is relatively flexible within obviously required guides. Um, but I do want to see innovation. I want to see creation coming up with solutions to problems because that's fundamentally what this is all about. And again, I'll say in, in Introduction to Lifestyle Medicine, there's at least one piece of assessment which you could publish if it's good enough. Um, the same is true for models of care. So if, again, throughout the, throughout the assessment, there are opportunities for you to submit, publish, you know, build your career as you go as opposed to waiting until you finish the master's before you build your career. I'd like you to start making these networks and connections throughout your master's and start publishing, start building your expertise. And then, and then once your master's is finished, you know, you've got a beautiful care, you've got a beautiful model there you can build and, you know, good luck to you. So this is a quote that I often use, um, but it really highlights to me the idea of this capstone project. You know, don't ask yourself what the world needs, ask, ask yourself what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people who come alive. And it's very poetically summarizes the philosophy behind what we're trying to do here. Um, I've only got two slides left, so I'm going to finish these slides and then I'm going to switch this off and I'm going to just answer those 25 questions. So. This is an example study plan. So the top two rungs are grad cert, the bottom, the middle one is grad dip and the bottom is the master's. It's just an example template. Um, so if you're doing two, two subjects a semester, say with the, grad, with the master's, we'll just look at the bottom, then this is maybe how you do it. Um, you can switch around some of these. There's a bit of flexibility. Some of these subjects are only at, um, available in certain semesters. So, and that's purely because... Um, we don't have a large team at this stage. Um, and so, again, you know, if this is successful and, and, we, and we can progress this, which I'm sure we will, uh, then we'll get more and we'll make it available in both semesters. If you, the three credit point elective is obviously things you could claim RPL for, so you could thin out those. And or if you've, say, like Jill, have done a postgraduate training in health coaching and behaviour change, well, you probably don't need to do that subject. You can have RPL for that one. Um, I will also say that a lot of the, well, I think I say this in the next one, yeah. So a lot of, I mean, the lectures, they're pre-recorded. I've intentionally, again, with design, uh, made it because I understand that you are busy people. Um, and, the, and like I said, that whilst the reality is this will be work, there's no way around that. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to dance around the fact that there is quite a bit of work in some of the subjects. Uh, because I have a high standard <laughs> and I want you to have a high standard. The, but I've intentionally designed it so that you can either, you can read the lectures because that's how I learn. I prefer to read. I, I, uh, I don't listen and watch things well. I fall asleep. So, but some people prefer to listen when they're driving or running or washing up or something. I will be recording them so that you can listen to it or you can watch it as well. So 
I've tried to keep that in mind for your convenience. Um, there are learning activities like tutorials or Q and A's or little quizzes within the platform, really just to drive your engagement. Because what I would love to see is to, you know, a bit of debate on the discussion board. I'd love to see people sharing resources, talking about problems in applications and how do we overcome this? Here's something I came across with. So we can strengthen each other's community because I'm not gonna pretend for a moment that I'm more of an expert in a certain field than perhaps some of you here, say exercise physiology, for example. I'm not an exercise physiologist, despite my passion in the area. So your expertise will contribute as well. Um, there are tutorials, so the health in, in all of the subjects, but in particular, there are weekly health coaching tutorials um, to practice the content and practice our skills in the health coaching subject. You don't have to, they are, you have to attend three of the 10 to 12, so it's, not a huge hurdle, but they are there for you. I'm gonna try and make myself available, maybe for a little bit of deep and meaningful at some time, we can sit back, have a green tea and talk. Um, so I'll make that clear. Um, and the assessment, whilst there's a lot of content you, you will enjoy, I hope, <laughs> there are no exams. So you don't have to freak out about memorizing every little statistic um, because again, I have found exams okay in my time but most of us forget it a week after we've finished memorizing it all. So rather I'm trying to think about ways that this is actually gonna be useful to you in your career. Like I said, write a literature review on a topic of your choosing, pick something that you really wanna know about, submit it to me, well, I'll mark it. If it's good, maybe we could publish it, but it's, maybe you could publish it. So it's, I'm trying to make this practical and useful for you. And fundamentally I'm here to support you. So that's all I'm gonna say, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, we've got, I apologize that we're longer, but we did stop and start. So um, can you, I'm just going to answer this one I can see. Can we do one subject per semester? I've started GP training. Okay, awesome. Well, congrats on starting GP training. And yes, you're very wise to be cautious. Uh, yes, you can do one subject per semester. You can, you can, you, that, that part-time was the max, you know what I mean? For the diploma and the, and well, all of them, maximum for the diploma and master's max two, two subjects a semester. But if you want to drag it out for longer, which I think is very sensible in certain situations, um, yes, I'm doing a master's of public health as we speak with the dissertation and all that sort of stuff. And I'm just, I'm just chipping away at it. <laughs> so it's probably the same with Jill with her master's of health coaching psychology. So That's right. Sam, I just want to um, jump in. There's two people that wanted to know your uh, reference for the punch, yeah. the punch scenario. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, bring that up. I'll uh, go through my lecture notes and see if I can find it. Um, but yeah, go on. While, whilst you're doing that, I'll. Um, is there anything else? Um, I think you answered most of these things. A lot of people were asking about the difference, again, between um, RPL, I suppose, and that could be whether you've done um, recognition of prior learning through... ASLAM, which is the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine or other degrees. I, I think it, Sam's made it clear that you just look at what you've done in your life, write it all in the application and Sam's gonna go through it all and look at each case individually. Am I, am I right, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, all your applications go to admissions first. If you tick all the boxes, then it will. I will never see it. Um, but if there's any questions, queries, they send it to me and I review it. Um, and just so I answer your question, I put in two links there. Um, this uh, Dr. Eisenberger, I think I've got the right person. So they're just links from my lecture notes. But um, he did a TED talk, I think, on why social rejection hurts or something. So um, you can watch that. Oh, no, it wasn't him. Sorry, it was Lieberman's. I'll put in that link. Here we go. On the social brain. I'm being very being very generous tonight there we go <laughs> uh, a couple of people have written you know do you have to do research if you're not interested in that component no you absolutely don't so um no is the short version so you have to do research methodology you have to do that subject because really everyone needs to understand research methodology if you're going to work in health profession like you just got to understand it um so there's, and you've got to know how to critically appraise information we're, we're so saturated with with social media health messaging now that it's hard for even us to know what's true and not. So, so it's more important than ever that we understand those components. 
but for your master's project, no, it doesn't have to be research per se. You just have to do some evaluation. So for example, um, so I'll tell you about one of the projects that I'm doing, for example. So, so we're building what's called Life and Mind, which is a lifestyle medicine and mental health um, education program on Future Learn platform. Future Learn is a platform that a lot of universities use. And um, the, there are six modules within that. What is lifestyle medicine, mental health, behavior change, health coaching, built environment, research methodology, and how do you build programs in mental health care settings? Because this is one of my areas of passion. Um, and so a part of that program, we did do a Delphi study first, but you wouldn't need to do that, but you would need to develop the program and then add on some evaluation at the end. So what we're doing is simply, you know, how did you find this course? You know, that sort of evaluation, qualitative feedback, and then following up maybe three months later and saying, what impact did this have on your practice? So I go through this in the subjects. This, you, you shouldn't be worried about this because we talk in the model of care subject about what are different types of evaluation, qualitative, quantitative, and different things. And then in the research methodology and, and with your talk with your supervisor, you can discuss on what you want that to be. So really it's, if you, it can be very practical if you want to make it very practical. And I would encourage that because I love to see practical things. Terrific. There's still heaps more, but um, I'm just trying to see Thanks. if there's anything else we can speak to. Um, somebody was asking about, can international students apply? International uh, students can apply and they can be admitted. We have had a couple already. I, you know, if I was going to be totally honest about this, I don't like the price <laughs> of yeah. university fees. Um, and but that's outside my control. So uh, it is obviously full fee paying from international students. Um, there are scholarships available, which you can apply through JCU and go through that, that those links are online. If, if in my fantasy world, I would have scholarships because I, I, I think that the price should not be a prohibition to this. And if anything, we need these programs in other countries. Well, just as much, if not more, and I would love to. So, so that's a problem that I've got to solve in the next year or so, but, you know, watch this space. Um, I do have another one sort of related to that. An overseas healthcare professional, am I eligible? Yeah, so, same thing. It just depends on what you, where your citizenship or resident permanent residency is, is. So if you're an Australian citizen working overseas, you might have to speak to admissions. There might be something, but I basically answered that. But uh, I think it means more like if you're a doctor working in America or something like that. Oh, okay, sorry. Still apply yeah, so, so, yeah, no, it's a very good question. Okay, so medicine is medicine no matter where you go. So yes, health coaching is health coaching no matter where you go. I will say that the first one week of the model of care subject is Australia, fairly Australian-centric because I can't talk about the healthcare system in every country in the world. I started to. <laughs> and then decided not to so the so i focus on australia but the reality is that australia does is whilst we have a different funding mechanism i.e the mbs there are other problems that are very similar across the world whether it's gross dependence on pharmacotherapy and waiting for people to get sick and those common problems that happen so um but then the rest of the subject is is pretty is, is applicable everywhere really um there are nuances of course because every health system funding is different but i, I try and do my best um, can you start with enrolling in the grad dip and then yes you can so you can you can roll with the grad cert or grad dip and then if you decide yes I like this um, you can extend it to the masters I'll also add the opposite is true so the, the we start on the 21st of February the census date is I think around the 24th of March give or take um, so you have you can actually enroll and if you don't like it as long as you and I, I'm sure this is true I'm 95% sure this is true um, probably 99% sure this is true, that you can pull out before the census and you won't incur a, a fee or a penalty. So if you want to try it and just then you check it out and decide that, no, it's not my flavour, that's fine, I won't be offended. But it's, um, you know, so, so both, both are true. Um, I, I think we've gotten to most things. Uh, you know, a, a few questions we might have missed, but um, thank you to everyone for all your amazing questions. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'll just, I'll just say is you can probably throw it in the chat or Q and A. I'll just give you thirty seconds. Are there any like 
major burning questions that haven't been answered. I'll just see this online course kicks off February the 21st. So about four weeks from now. Um, like I said, you've got until up to census to enroll as well. You'll just be doing a bit of catching up. Um, when do applicant applications finish? I basically answered that up to census date. Um, yep. And yes, uh, Krishna, it's the first year running this course. I've been teaching lifestyle medicine within the GP training program and other programs for some time. So it's certainly not my first time teaching it, uh, but this course specifically, the way it is up online, yes, that is new um, in that sense. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, com I'm not, I, as you can tell, hopefully you can tell, I'm not interested in sales talk. So you just do whatever you feel is right for you guys. The, um, what units will run session two, please? I think that means semester two. Is that what that means? Semester two? So what units will run in semester two? So lifestyle medicine assessment and prescription and the capstone project run in semester two and the health and the research methodology to health professionals is in one and two and the, the three grad certs are in semester one only, but I think it's likely to extend to both in the coming one or two years. Can you complete it? Uh, no, you can't complete it sooner than three years, uh, only because that's just the way the subjects are being rolled out. Um, one day, yes, you will be able to, uh, when they switch to full-time, but not at this stage. Um, is it possible to speak some for the application? Yes, you can actually speak to admissions. Just contact admissions at jcu.edu.au. And if they have a question they can't answer, they will forward it to me and I will probably be in contact with you directly. And now you at least know what I look and sound like. Um, that, that answers that question. Sorry, Jill, I'm, I'm just, I'm becoming a dictator. No, <laughs> um, They're so, firing fast, yeah, um, which is it. great. Could we meet in person? Could we meet our colleagues in person? It's um, it's a great point. And, and at this stage, we, we do online collaborations and tutorials. I, I, I sort of fantasize about, you know, if we can find people and you can put up your postcode and you're comfortable to share that, you can catch up in person. Um, and that's often what we do in GP training. We get them people to catch up in their localities. Uh, so that's something, but that's a bit of a bonus thing. I haven't built that in as a compulsory thing. Can we have an excursion to First Nations community that does life medicine? Well, that's amazing. That's a great question. Well, uh, again, it's not built in at this stage, but you sound like you've got a lot of great ideas. <laughs> so uh, join in. But I will also say that that's where your assessment comes in. So the model of care, one of the model of care assessments, the second piece of assessment in the model of care subject is to choose a model of care. You can choose any, it can be, it can be a technology, it can be an online program, it can be a face-to-face -face program and get in contact with them, be a grown up professional, get in contact with them. Cause this is how I've learned a lot of what I've learned is to go direct to the source. People will know with my podcast that I'd go direct to the source. And, um, and I ask them the questions, I say, how did you do it? How did you get over that barrier? How did you do this? And that's your assessment. So this, to me, that's a good piece of assessment because that's going to help you, right? So you can do that. You can go into the Aboriginal uh, medical services or community control health services. You can hopefully, you know, do everything in a culturally safe and respectful and appropriate way. Um, but you can, you can ask them these questions. And I've also given some flexibility in the assessment. And I've said, it's, if you can't get all this out of information, don't worry because, you know, intellectual property exists and I don't expect people just to hand you out their algorithms but you just do what you can um, and you say what you would want to get, et cetera. So again, you know, uh, yes. Yeah, so Natasha, you said there's no grad cert units running in semester two. So you can do the elective in semester two. So the electives are any time and the electives come from public, I should have said this, sorry. Electives come from public health, the MBA, the masters of business admin. So marketing and that sort of stuff, um, health professional education, Aboriginal health. Um, I think they're the main four categories. And um, so you can start, you can do that. You can start in semester two and you can um, start with your elective, but then you'd have to do the other subjects, you know, in semester one. I know it's a bit annoying, but that's just, that's the natural restrictions at the moment. But like I say, watch this space. Will there be ACLAM recognition? No. Well, maybe I haven't spoken to ACLAM. Um, so I haven't, I, all I can say is I don't know. I haven't spoken to them, but it's a reasonable idea. I mean, I might as well speak to Buslam as well and see if they're happy to recognize it. You can get three fellowships. <laughs> yep. Okay. I think, 
oh, what's the main difference in Southern Cross Uni and JCU? Uh, look, I don't, I obviously can't fully answer that because um, I don't work at Southern Cross. I do know Professor John Stevens who's setting that up. Um, if I was going to, there's, I think, two major differences. The first is that John is a sociologist um, and so I'm a clinician primarily. So there's a different approach here. I'm, I, I think about, I very much focus on the person. I'm very patient centric. And I think about in the end, how does this translate to the front line? That's, that's my thinking because that's my bias. That's my experience. And hence I think about models and I think about all the limitations. I think John is thinking, and I don't want to say John is amazing. I will say he's an absolute leader in the field. So I'm sure that course will be amazing. Um, but I, he's not a clinician. So there's, there's a slight difference there. And I suspect that will come out. Um, obviously, I'm a doctor. Um, he, he's not. So there'd probably be some differences there. But that doesn't mean it's better or worse, just different. Um, and then the other thing is the S Southern Cross University course is a different model. So they do one subject at a time and it's stackable. But say you've signed up for them. So they only offer the masters. There's no grad sort of grad dip. So if you exit early, you don't get anything. With our course, if you exit early, you get whatever you finish. So if you sign up for a master's, but you say, no, I'm getting married and I want to go traveling now that the borders have opened, great. You can put it on pause and take your grad dip and, and put it on your name and enjoy your life. So there are some, there are, there's pros and cons either way. Um, and, but that's just an honest answer for you. Um, oh, I didn't know that. So there's no Commonwealth supported places at SCU. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a pretty major thing. Um, uh, will, a co will a course address billing for lifestyle medicine consultations, GP here? Mm. Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, it, it's, I think that this is something that will probably come out in some of the tutorials because some of the tutorials and conversations we have are very much about lifestyle medicine practice, like what are the practical mm -hmm. barriers and, and, you know, billing and money and time are the, probably the two major ones. Um, and so it's very much a case of like, how, how do we, how do we get around this? Now, if you're an Australian GP, we're going to have to work with the MBS. So we're going to have to work with, you know, whatever mechanism you're working with. So, so we don't, we don't talk about it in the lectures specifically. We do in shared medical appointments. How do you bill that? So that is covered. Um, but to me, the MBS is the MBS. I mean, you know, we've been trying to lobby and change it for bloody ages. <laughs> so I think also it's important to think about, I mean, again, the Australian model has its limitations and, and, and the good things about it as well. But sometimes, and maybe the future is looking more, less at a fee for service and more at a value-based model. Um, and so, you know, that's something people who are working towards making lifestyle medicine integrated into healthcare a bit better can look for different ways of billing. So those of us that practice lifestyle medicine can make money because let's face it, we all have mortgages to pay and bills to pay, et cetera. So I definitely think um, watch this space. It's for me anyway, it's a discussion to be had about how do we make money out of lifestyle medicine? Yeah. How do we make it financially sustainable? The, um, yeah. you know, so as, as Jill said, there are, there are mechanisms. So there's membership models that are being proposed um, and there are a raft of sort of ways to subsidize these things. No one, I, I haven't found anyone who's sort of figured it out yet. So this is very much a, you know, a field, a problem to be overcome. How can allied health use this as we don't have access to Medicare rebates? And it doesn't matter. I'm just, I'm, I apologize for talking about Medicare. I'm a GP. The, um, you, so ignore the whole Medicare thing. That's, that's just me being biased. The, um, Allied Health absolutely can use everything I've just everything I've just said for the past hour and ten minutes is. I mean, Allied Health, you already figured it out a while ago. You went and did you went into dietetics or EP, but it's um, so, you know, so it, it just it's so we've got a lot of. I mean, within Aslam, for example, um, forty percent of the members are doctors. The other sixty percent are not doctors. They're either they Allied Health nurses, uh, research, public health people, that sort of stuff. So it's very you know, and so you might you might be a dietitian, but you want to start practicing you know, meditate, you want to prescribe meditation, basic movement program, social connection, you know, this is, you would do that. You would expand your repertoire, your tools in the toolbox. How do you bill for that? Well, I'll come back to what we said before there. That, that, that's, a tr that's a tricky one. No worries, Pauline. Thank you for coming. Okay. I, I feel that we're, we're rounding up. Um, oh, Heidi, I've answered the question. What's the max credit? You can get 12 credit points for subjects equivalent. 
Um, oh, I will also say that you can do cross cross institution, which means that I have to double check this. I know what I'm about to say is true. And the second part, I'm not 100% on. The first part is if you want to go and do a master somewhere else for what, you know, in I've got some people, they want to go do one in planetary health, but you want to do a couple of my subjects, you can apply just to do my subjects and put it as RPL. As long as both institutions agree that it can be counted, then that's fine. And I'm, I've got to check that the reverse is also true, that if you want to go and do a subject in another university, then do I, they have to approve it. Do I have to, I don't know the answer to that question, but I like the idea of it. Um, so I'm going to go, I've been meaning it's on my list. So that maybe answers your question. Is it public possible questions that have been asked in this session? So my understanding is that this is recorded and you will be able to watch it later. Um, I'm not sure about the actual, um, the actual chat function and Q and A. Um, yes, it is very useful. Thanks, Alicia. All right. Um, I think we're done. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, and thank you so much, Jill, for joining me and being part of the mission and the vision. Um, and uh, thank you, obviously, JCU, and thank you, everyone. So good evening.